Just like the wind, we can't see magnetism, but we can see and feel the effects of it. I think a good way to explain just how magnetic neutralization works can best be done in this illustration. Here we have five permanent magnets attached to the backside of a coil. The magnetism from those five magnets is flowing through the core of the coil. On the piston are two magnets. The two sets of magnets are set to repel each other. They're placed in a vertical position so we can utilize the force of gravity. Push down on the piston, Danny. Note the repelling force of the magnets. Do it two or three times, Danny. We're going to to apply some DC electricity to the coil, which will stop the magnetic flow from the five magnets through the core of the coil. Now we're going to turn off the electricity to the coil and watch what happens. The magnetic flow returns, and there you have it. Magnetic neutralization. It's that simple. Let's do that two or three times, Danny. Using this magnetic neutralization, we're going to demonstrate what we believe to be an over-unity device. In a more simple term, something that produces more power than it takes to run it. The timing cam is 155 degrees. It controls when and how long electricity is applied to the coil per revolution, which is only 43% of the time. Note the coil is activated here and deactivated here. We're using this linkage mechanism to convert the linear motion to rotary. It's good for that, but I feel a poor way to utilize the motor's full potential. When the magnetic force is at its greatest in this position, this mechanism is at its weakest point of power production, hardly any leverage at all. As it gets to its strongest point about that position, the magnetic force is getting weaker and weaker. We have these five magnets attached to the core of the coil. They're held in place by this bolt mechanism. Each of the magnets are three inches in diameter and one inch long. We have two magnets attached to the piston. These magnets and the ones attached to the coil are repelling each other. When the coil is energized, it neutralizes the repelling force of the magnets attached to the coil, allowing the two sets of magnets to come together. When the coil is de-energized, the repelling force returns, thrusting the piston forward. 100% of the motor's output power is produced by the permanent magnets. The coil is only a switch, which when the proper voltage is applied, blocks the magnetic force of the magnets attached to it. There are two input forces to the coil. It's under the influence of the permanent magnets throughout each and every cycle. When the voltage from the battery is applied, that in itself creates something called back EMF in the coil, which has to come out. When the voltage from the battery is turned off, there's an inrush of magnetism into the coil from the five magnets attached to it. The magnets on the piston are having a profound effect on the coil by inducing their magnetism into it, which in turn creates electricity and quite a bit of it just as the batteries are applying an electrical charge to the coil, so are the magnets. The oscilloscope is just seeing the voltage. It doesn't know where it's coming from, whether it's from the batteries or the magnetic forces on the coil. The motor is utilizing both electrical inputs. We're going to demonstrate this to you now. The coil isn't hooked to the batteries at all, and watch what happens when Danny rotates the large gear by hand.
With the motor running, all of this creates some pretty weird waveforms on the oscilloscope. This can make it a little challenging as to which is the proper way to measure the input power from the batteries. We're using the original method for determining horsepower, which is horsepower equals 33,000 foot-pounds of work done in one minute. It came about by an average horse being able to lift 330 pounds 100 feet in one minute. We'll be converting that horsepower into watts, with 746 watts being the equivalent of one horsepower. The weight being lifted, which is 22 pounds, rises 3.267 inches per revolution. We'll be converting that into foot-pounds, the foot-pounds into horsepower, and the horsepower into watts, which will be the motor's output power. We'll then compare that to the input watts to the coil. I tend to think that most people are under the impression that an over-unity device must somehow break the laws of physics. This device doesn't even bend the laws of physics, let alone break any. We've spent more time checking the input power to the coil of this motor than it took to build the motor itself. I've sought help from four individuals professionals in electric motors and electronics, people able to use oscilloscopes who should be qualified to determine how to check the input power of this device. I got very different answers from all of them. One stated this wasn't an over-unity device. The statement he used in describing why it wasn't an over-unity device in itself defied the laws of physics. One of those four individuals agreed with me. He's the only one who's actually seen the motor in person and has done so three times, spending several hours each visit. He's an electronic engineer and has even taught it in college. He stated that he didn't understand exactly what was going on and that he had never seen magnets used in this fashion and that probably no one else has either. The others are engineers also, but have only seen videos and information from the oscilloscope. Then I got to thinking about how when we were building this device, that it seemed for the longest time, no matter what we thought was going to make it all happen, turned out to take us in the opposite direction. 180 degrees from where we thought it would. I mean, we were so sure. Then I asked myself a couple of questions. Has anyone ever checked the input of an over-unity device? I doubt it. Do they know exactly how it should be done? I doubt it. By using what has been the standard method, just maybe they'll find themselves 180 degrees in the opposite direction to how it should be done. Is this an over-unity device? Well, I think so. If not, do I believe it's possible for mankind to come up with an over-unity device? Yes. And if that should happen, I think it'll be through an accumulation of knowledge over time. One person adding to another's work. People having the same frame of mind, working together to make it happen. People who are willing to share their knowledge.